Okay, it is uh, six oh one, so we are going to uh, begin. It's storming outside. I hope everybody is safe. I know we had some flooding out there, so I hope everybody's uh, safe at home and and uh, ready for what should be a tremendous session this evening. So uh, my name is Aaron Spence. For those of you who don't know me, I'm the superintendent of Virginia Beach City Public Schools, and it's my pleasure to be here with all of you this evening. And I want to thank you so much for joining us for for the second staff information session that we're holding with the very first of our VB Safe Together series of information sessions. I'll note at the outset that we have five more of these sessions scheduled, one for every Thursday night through the start of the school year. And we're hoping to get your answers, uh, get answers to your questions, um, uh, both at this session tonight and then as we go uh, forward to the, to the start of the school year. Tonight's session, of course, is for staff um, only from Virginia Beach City Public Schools. And, um, and I've brought some folks along with me tonight to answer questions that we've gotten from you that have been submitted over the course of the last several days. And I do know that you have questions. I do know uh, because I've heard from many of you that you have concerns and you're anxious. Um, and part of our goal tonight is to try to allay some of those concerns and uh, create more understanding around our plan for uh, reopening in the fall when that's possible to do so physically, but also virtually at the beginning of the year, talk about the metrics that we have in place to assist us with that, and uh, really try to dive a little bit more into those, understand those, and then understand some of the other questions associated with the opening of schools. So with all of that said, um, I'd like to acknowledge some folks who are here with me tonight to help answer those questions. I'll start with several physicians uh, who are with us this evening. These are physicians who have been supporting us as we've been endeavoring to understand what all this means for us in terms of opening our schools safely. And uh, specifically physicians who joined us on a medical advisory work group to help develop the metrics that are in our plan. And I'm gonna ask them to briefly introduce themselves. And uh, I'll just go down the list here. I think alphabetically, we'll start with Dr. Heidi Best. Yeah, hi, um, I'm Heidi Best. I'm an emergency physician with the Emergency Physicians of Tidewater. We staff all of the Sentara Emergency Departments um, from Suffolk, Virginia Beach, and Norfolk. Um, and I've been in the area since 2006, went to residency at EVMS, and have been here ever since. Thank you, Dr. Best. Also with us this evening is Dr. Peter Laplace. Um, Dr. Laplace. Hi, and thank you for uh, letting me be part of this process. Um, I'm in um, internal medicine and private practice with two other partners. So I care for 18-year-olds uh, and older. And um, uh, I also went to EVMS for a medical school and residency some years back. So thank you again. Thank you for being here this evening. I'd also like to introduce Dr. Doug Mitchell. Dr. Mitchell. Hi, thanks for having us. Um, Dr. I'm Doug Mitchell, I'm uh, currently a general pediatrician at Norfolk Pediatrics, which is one of the CHKD general pediatric groups. Uh, I've been in the region since 1992. I'm also board certified in infectious diseases. And um, I, for the last six years, I've been the medical director for all of the CHKD general pediatric practices. Um, also, in a situation like this, a hospital stands up an incident command structure, uh, and I've been part of that uh, incident command structure for CHKD, uh, dealing with the logistics of uh, the COVID pandemic at the hospital level. Thank you so much. Um, we appreciate that, Dr. Mitchell, for you being here this evening. And then finally, I'd like to introduce um, Dr. Dr. Leah Rowland. Dr. Rowland? Hi, I'm, I'm Dr. Leah Rowland. I um, did my training in Mayo Clinic and um, it was too cold for me there. So I moved here about 15 years ago. I'm a general pediatrician um, in one of the CMG groups, pediatric specialists um, in work primarily in Norfolk, but take kids, take care of kids from all over the area. i um, also been involved on the state level um, with the Virginia American Academy of Pediatrics, working on a task force for school reopening, teaming up with, with um, pediatricians across the state. Thanks for having me. Yeah, well, thank you for being here. And, and I'll note we had a number of other physicians who served on the work group with a wide range of specialties and expertise in adult medicine, emergency medicine, 
uh, mental health and, and of course, pediatric medicine, and, and as you heard, infectious diseases and other uh, expertise to include public health. And so we're very grateful for, for all of those folks who, who agreed to uh, work with us. Also, from our health leadership team, I'd like to acknowledge Mary Shaw, who's here with us this evening. She's the coordinator for student health here in Virginia Beach. Thank you, Mary, for being here. Uh, and you all will have a chance to hear from Mary a little bit later. Um, from our, uh, also from our leadership team here in Virginia Beach, we do have a number of other folks. So we have these terrific health advisors, but also uh, all of the expertise that we have here in Virginia Beach um, um, across the entire school division and representative of that tonight, some of the leadership in the division. And so just recognizing very quickly and thanking John Mira, our Chief Human Resources uh, Officer, who's here with us this evening. Uh, Mr. Jack Freeman, our Chief Operations Officer, who's here with us this evening. Dr. Kip Rogers, who's our Chief Academic Officer, here with us this evening. Admin Alexander, who is acting as our Chief um, uh, for the Department of Communications and Community Engagement. And uh, Dr. Don Robertson, who's here with us this evening, our Chief Schools Officer. And also Farrell Hansiker, our Chief Finance Officer, who's here with us this evening. So thanks to all of you for being here. And I think with this group, we will really have an opportunity to answer some of the questions um, that you all have posed for us. Um, briefly, I just want to mention that for the first half of the session, roughly, um, we're going to be focusing on questions for our physicians. We wanted to make sure since they were so gracious to join us tonight that we gave them the opportunity to answer some of the questions that are health related that you all have asked us, that our staff has asked us. And then the second half, we will transition over to questions that are really uh, questions that our staff can answer and are prepared to answer tonight. Um, and uh, with all of that said, I'm going to jump right in and turn it over to our physicians. So again, um, thank you all so much for joining us. We do have a number of questions from staff about health-related issues, but before we get to those, I was wondering if you all would mind taking just a, a talking just a little bit about the work that you did as a work group to advise us on these health metrics that we've been talking about in our plan and how you arrived at those health metrics and what confidence you have uh, in those as a guide for helping us get students back to school as we wrestle with this pandemic as a school division. I can start with that. Um, when we were first considering how to fashion metrics that would make sense in giving the school district guidance on when to reopen, we started looking broadly. Um, we wanted to know if anybody else was doing this. Um, we looked at the WHO recommendations, WHO recommendations, as well as the CDC to see how other diseases have been studied. Um, we knew that it would be important to look both at test positivity rate as well as the overall incidence of cases in the population to determine what parameters should be considered when determining when it's safe for kids to return to school. Now the test positivity piece, that's important because it gives you a sense not only of whether people who are requesting testing have the disease, but also the community's ability to test. So in other words, if you don't look at test positivity, the disease numbers could be low, but that might only be because you're not frequently testing because the community might lack resources. So when this is the case, you don't have any idea how burdensome the disease is in the community. And so this was was going on with us in Hampton Roads in March and April. There weren't that many diagnosed cases of COVID, but no one really knew how prevalent the disease actually was because we didn't have enough tests. Um, we were really only testing the sickest patients at that time. So then we think about, well, what are the ranges of positivity we should look at? So we considered first that the CDC and the WHO stated in the past that a 5% threshold could be used as a threshold for opening school. Um, but these statements were released prior to the American Academy of Pediatrics guidance and the CDC guidance regarding the necessity to open school due to harms from ch to children from long-term closures, um, as well as understanding the dangers and the transmissibility of the disease. Um, just last week, the US Surgeon General um, argued and agreed that the 10% test positivity is a reasonable threshold um, for school reopening. Um, more importantly is that we looked at the state of Virginia and we looked at the phases. We've all heard about the Forward Virginia Plan, phase one, two, three, and the 10% threshold is what is allowing us to stay in 
in phase three. And so when Virginia as a state relies on 10% test positivity to remain there, if you require less than 5% for school reopening, you basically guarantee that schools will not reopen until herd immunity is achieved through infections or immunizations. Um, either of these could take years. So we as a group um, just felt that that didn't really appropriately take into consideration the importance of school reopening, not just to children, but to society as a whole. So adults in Virginia would just continue to go about their business um, while children were home for long periods of time and the closures of school would be very prolonged without community benefit and arguably, arguably with a lot of harm. Um, so our metrics also consider disease incidents. So we used 100 new cases on a rolling seven day average per 100,000 population per week as the upper or red threshold for incidents. Um, the disease incidents cutoffs were replicated in the literature um, because we found these specific cutoffs in the National COVID-19 Task Force for Governors. And so if you look at this document, they classify all the states. Each state has, has a different page. And so that was um, where we started to model the, the red, yellow, green. Um, and they helped guide and, and show where the states were as far as significant numbers in the US. And so there, there aren't any previously published numbers to rely on, but, but because this was about a weekly incidence of 0.1%, it seems like a, a reasonably low threshold. So then we looked at, we said, okay, we have these numbers. Let's look at them retroactively. Let's see how these numbers would have worked had we been using them since March. And so when we took our system and we applied it, the red, yellow, green system, in our eastern region, schools would have been closed um, until early May because the high test positivity um, and the limiting testing supply that we had. And this fit with our clinical sense that we really shouldn't have been open during that time because we didn't know how much the disease was occurring in the community. Um, and then we also saw that through late May and June, schools would have been open by this metric in, turn, in terms of disease incidence and test positivity. But in early July, both by these two metrics, test positivity and disease incidence, we moved into the red and schools would have closed and we're still in the red on both of these metrics. So it was sort of applying to what we've already been through that, that helped us feel strongly that you know we're on we were on the right track with that um, and so uh, most most folks we felt you know we talked to different clinicians um, agreed in the work group felt that if we had taken more of a res restrictive measure and insisted in being on the green for both metrics then we would have never opened schools because the 0.01 percent incidence um, is such a low threshold that Again, we wouldn't have reached until herd immunity. So um, Virginia continues to operate in phase three at the 10% cutoff. And so a lot of this is you know, risk benefit, but much of it we looked at Virginia. And a couple other points I wanted to make, I know this is a lot to digest, but another way that our metrics has a layer of safety is that we consider regional data. And this is extremely important because if you look at the state of Virginia, um, we may stay in phase three, but if our area is kind of a hot spot like it is now, and the rural areas of the state are sort of helping our state look better than it should be, our metrics help take into account what's actually going on in our own backyard. And so then we can close appropriately as we need to. And even when you consider this, some of the state's guidance regarding um, substantial disease spread, our metrics are a bit more conservative in that because they're seeing in the red zones or the hot, the um, substantial spreads that K through three should be open. But we felt that it was most reasonable to watch and wait um, before opening in the red zones. Um, one other thing, <laughs> For at the risk of talking too long, but shared these um, metrics with other health departments in the area, as well as districts in our region and even throughout the state. And other folks who have looked at it and are really starting to look to apply it to their own areas. So, um, you know, these are folks who are open, trying to look at safe reopenings for their schools. So we have to continue to look at new data and information, but 
this data-driven way is, gives us a starting point and it can be used alongside all of the other mitigation measures. It can't just be used by itself. We have to do all of the other things that we know are, are best to keep our staff safe. Um, I hope I didn't go on too long, but it's a big question you started with there. <laughs> it is a big question and I think it's important to understand how those metrics were developed and, and, and why there's some confidence in, in, in them creating a safer environment for us to bring uh, students and most especially our staff back um, staff back to school. We hear a lot of concerns about it being dire to come back to school under yellow metrics, but I think you did a good job of explaining why those metrics actually allow for us to do to do that a little bit more safely. Um, I didn't know any of the other physicians wanted to weigh in on that before I jump into some questions, direct questions from our staff. I know Dr. Mitchell was going to discuss a little bit and update us about some of our numbers right now if you wanted him to do that. Put you on the spot. <laughs> Forgot to unmute. Um, sure, you know, I, just reviewing the data that are publicly available uh, for both of those metrics right now, um, you know, the, for the eastern region as of this morning for that rolling seven day average, and that's also important to understand, none of these numbers are looked at just a single day. They're a rolling seven day average that gives us a trend over time. And we're still definitely in that red zone for the number of cases in our region. Uh, the number I saw this morning was 404 and the, that 100 uh, per 100,000 cut point was at 265 in, in what, we, uh, what has been recommended. In all of Virginia right now, the percent positivity as of this morning is about 7.3%. But on the south side, we're at 10.9%. Virginia Beach specifically at 9.7, so it might be heading the right way. Uh, everybody cross their fingers, and we could be heading the right direction, but there's still a lot going on in our region because Norfolk specifically is at 11.3% positivity and Chesapeake at 12.8% positivity. So um, some good trends heading the right way. We're recovering from the scolding that Governor Northam gave us last week in the Eastern re region and hopefully making some progress. Yeah, and I just wanted to um, piggyback on that a little bit. A um, couple of things that I wanted to highlight what Dr. Roland said um, was that none of this is developed in, uh, in a silo, meaning the mitigation risks are extremely important. We had a lot of dialogue about that as well. Um, so even though it actually isn't the, <laughs> the job of the physician work group to make sure that all of those mitigation strategies happen um, in the schools, uh, it was a big concern of ours, um, and so we wanted to make sure to highlight that it's not just we're going to open because the data says we should open. It is in concert with the mitigation strategy. So uh, very appreciative uh, of uh, the city public school team uh, for taking that on as well. Right. Thank you, Dr. Besson. Yeah, and we'll we'll get to some of those mitigation strategies and some questions that we have later, and and we'll talk about those. But I think I think it's an important point and. And it also, you know, contemplated, you know, sort of phasing students back, so not opening all at once, but thinking about how we bring students back based on the data that's behind behind some of that. So I appreciate that. Um, we do have a couple of questions that I'm going to ask you all to specifically address, and then if you want to stay on as we go through the rest of the call and weigh in on some of the other questions that our staff may tackle. Um, so the the first one, I'm actually going to ask Mary to speak to it first, uh, and then and then you all, if you had if you wanted to weigh in, um, <clears throat> because I think. Um, uh, some of this was already addressed in what you all just talked about. So the question from a staff member is how is, how is the five to 10% range safe for K69, but not for seven, eight, 10, 11, 12? Uh, and then talks about WHO recommending less than 5% and epidemiologists 2%. Uh, and, and then noting that the yellow range is not safe by definition for anyone. So as I said, I think in your opening comments, Dr. Rowland, you, you really did address there's some, there's some differences in terms of what people view as, as probably safe for children. But Mary, um, you wanna talk a little bit about why, uh, um, why the staggered students? Well, yes, thanks Dr. Spence. Um, the first thing I wanna talk about is um, the CDC school guidance um, included that local school divisions consult with area health experts and consider community spread data in their return to school plans to bring students back in person. 
The CDC and the American Academy of Pediatrics recommended that should all grades not be able to return to in-person learning that a determination of what student groups and grades can return should be prioritized based on a need for in-person learning. The school division has ongoing consultation with, this, with the area health experts and, and the, the physicians that we're talking this evening uh, and the rest of the physicians. Uh, we continue to consult with them and to include public health, um, our medical director, and we'll follow our health metrics related to community spread levels. Our health experts support our plan as the level of community spread lowers to the yellow and then to the green levels to, pro to prioritize bringing back students. This will allow us to meet the health and safety mitigations. So simply put, um, Dr. Best and Dr. Mitchell talked about the levels, how they were developed. They talked about, um, we talked about the need to get our students back into in-person learning to make sure that our health and safety mitigations match up well with these levels. Uh, this is supported by um, uh, the CDC and the American Academy of Pediatrics um, and the prioritizing that the school division is doing in the yellow and green zone is important because our mitigation will fit that bringing back a students and we're considering what students are going to um, that need that benefit of in-person learning? Thank you, Mary. Um, you know, a sort of related question that we got, and it's related. Uh, the, the, we've been getting a lot of questions about this yellow metric, so there's been quite a bit of advocacy, I think, for from from some to uh, just eliminate that middle ground, and you know, you're either um, green or you're not. And, um, and I know Dr. Rowland, you spoke a little bit to, uh, to that and the idea essentially, and, and I've had, I've had the same conversation with public health uh, and, and been confirmed that, you know, if, if it's green or nothing, the likelihood of children returning to school this year is almost nil. Uh, and so, so trying to figure out how to bring students back, but at the same time, understanding that as we bring students back, we'll see that start to happen across the country that new information may come to light, either um, positive or negative. And so one of the questions was, as new information is coming to light regarding children and COVID, will you consider revising the plan um, <clears throat> to, to eliminate the yellow zone? Um, <clears throat> I don't know um, if any of you, if any of our physicians want to weigh in on, on what kinds of data we might want to be looking at as we, as we might think about that. What I would say, I guess, as an opening statement to that before you weigh in would be, yeah, we're, we're going to continue to monitor health conditions. I think all of you have agreed to continue to advise us and that we're going to continue to monitor health conditions um, and any new information. And I, I think at least for us, the important data is what's happening as schools are opening, right? And, and that includes here locally in Virginia Beach, but then also what's happening around the country. Um, so do any of you want to speak to that? And start, I would say that um, really exactly what you said is key is that um, unfortunately, we wish we really had black and white answers in this whole thing. It's, it's very frustrating to have this new disease come that we don't know, you know, is it transmitted by this age group, by that age group? And we, we're constantly gathering data. Um, there's things all over the news and then sometimes you go to the source article and it says something actually completely different. So that's why I feel that your staff should be really reassured that you are open to scientific data and input and guidance and not just making these decisions based on politics or what feels good. You know, that, that we're really trying to make informed decisions to protect our staff and students and balance risk and benefit on an ongoing basis. So right now, everything that we have really tells us, as well as looking at examples, you know, that I cited in my long opening monologue, um, you know, that, that, that these numbers are a really good solid start. Um, and will we continue to look at them and make sure that they are, that they make sense, kind of like we, what we did with the retroactive application? Absolutely. 
I mean, you know, if, if we need to consider something else, well, then we'll be calling you and we'll be telling you what's going on in the community and you'll be telling us what's happening in the schools and the health departments. There's a lot of partnership happening between health departments and community physicians and schools. And we're building that on a state level and a local level. And so all of that, we have to keep looking at the new information and what's actually happening. Um, another thing I think that's very helpful is that international Internationally, schools have remained open. Um, I was just on a conference with the, you know, people from all over the world that were talking about schools. And so we can look at, at that data as well and um, continue to see, it's not just these metrics, these are the metrics for the next two years. It's, it's this, is, this is a reasonable place to start and, and then let's continue to gather information. So I have a couple of specific um, sort of less about the metrics and the, the plan writ large and some, some questions that are more specific about some um, kind of just general health issues in terms of mitigation perhaps. So, so one of them, uh, which I think is interesting, is um, I'd like to ask your medical experts their thoughts on the safety of a staff member wearing a face shield instead of a mask in relation to the transmission of the virus and they elaborate how safe is it for the wearer and how safe is it for those who come into contact with somebody who is only wearing a face shield in place of a face mask. And so um, I'd, ask, um, I'd ask you all to weigh in on that. Dr. I Alfonso, I'll comment on that. Um, you know, if you think about our efforts to prevent an infection, between people, it's all about a barrier. So it's either gonna be distance or some sort of shield or mask to keep you from getting the virus into your respiratory system. You know, this virus is, as far as we know, is mainly spread through droplets of uh, you know, saliva or mucus, and it is not, uh, there's not a big component of being spread, um, you know, just by floating freely in the air, as far as we know. So everything we do to prevent infection is to is to keep that virus in those droplets from getting into our, our mucous membranes and our nose or our mouth. Uh, less so in the eyes, there is some concern about that, but I don't think that's a big source of infection. So any barrier is gonna reduce the risk of transmission, whether you wear it on yourself or the person who may have the infection, you're gonna reduce the, the, particle, the, the um, particles of the virus from being either introduced into you or, or expressed from another person. So, you know, uh, face masks are effective. Um, face shields, I think studies have shown, can be very effective in keeping respiratory droplets from getting into your... I think you have to do what's most comfortable. Some people feel better wearing a face shield because they can see their facial expressions and that might be more um, amenable to teaching uh, that does offer very good protection, especially if you can maintain, you know, a, a distance of three to six feet. Um, so I think that's that's a, an adequate substitute. Um, and then if you wear a face mask under your shield, that's even better protection, but that may not be necessary. So. Um, so thank you, Dr. Plass, and I'll and I'll just elaborate that our plan does include an expectation for staff and students to wear uh, masks and because we know that's the first and best line of defense and I'm, there's a question in here about a mask um, and we know there may be um, some circumstances if you've got a child with sensory issues uh, if you've got a, an adult with a health issue related to that mask where we may have to make some accommodations and think about face shields we understand I think they're not as effective uh, but certainly could be a barrier as you as you described so I appreciate that um, I guess similarly to that, and it, it probably then ties into why we would make those recommendations in planning was droplet or airborne transmission used when making in building considerations. And so what was the kind of primary way you were thinking about, um, um, you know, transmission was it, were you thinking about airborne droplets, a combination of those, what, what, what informed your thinking? I guess I'll go ahead and tackle that one uh, to begin with, and that is the short answer is yes. I mean, that's been the conversation from the very beginning of this in March in, in the healthcare community and epidemiologists and infectious diseases specialists. There's been some misunderstanding of what those terms mean. 
um, and you have to be very cautious about what you're talking about. We do know that this is droplet spread, and that means that these are fairly large droplets. It's been shown fairly clearly that they really don't travel more than six feet. Um, they're not floating in the air down the hallway and around the hallway to infect others in another room, like some other infectious diseases that we deal with, like chickenpox and tuberculosis. Um, and so there's some differences in the terminology. Is it airborne for those six feet? Sure, but that's not typically what we refer to as aerosolized or airborne or those long-term transmission sorts of things. And so that's where the information is coming from, that six feet uh, golden distance that for, uh, for physical distancing, social distancing, and using the face coverings to trap those particles as they're coming out or if they get out before they're breathed in, accomplishing it that, in that way. And I'd say in the hospital as well, uh, we're using droplet precaution. Uh, unless we're doing a specific procedure that may aerosolize a virus, so if I have to um, intubate someone, so put a tube down their throat and put them on the ventilator, we're gowning up as if it's aerosolized. However, for every other patient that we're seeing that is known COVID positive, we're using droplet precautions. I have two other uh, questions, um, and they're probably related to, to these precautions. Um, and I'll, I'll ask them together, and then you guys can just kind of jump in and weigh in on, on those. So the, and, and these are for, for our physicians. We have a number of other questions for our staff. Um, what level of protection does a mask give if, if it is one layer, two layer, or three layers? And can we ensure that everyone wears the same type of mask to ensure the same level of protection. And so does that matter? I'll start there. And then the second one uh, related to masks. How many masks per day should an employee or student expect to use? Is using the same, uh, using the same mask all day is not ideal. Is that correct? Again, I'll go ahead and, and start on this one because this has been hot topic at the hospital level uh, repeatedly. As we look at the various methods for covering the face, um, the ideal one, uh, is everybody seeing it out there, the N95 masks. Um, and that's what Dr. Best was referring to. That's the sort of masking that's worn when you're really doing an aerosolizing procedure and must be um, exposed to the real high risk situations. Those masks are only useful if they've been fit tested, applied appropriately, worn appropriately, and they need to be fit tested and the right size to the each individual. Um, that's sort of where you need to be for those high risk situations. What Dr. Best was referring to for the other ones, what we call procedural masks or commonly known as surgical masks. Um, those are um, a, a fabric product. They also have an electrostatic charge uh, that helps gather the particles. And so they can be thinner by nature. So they're easier to wear, they're easier to breathe through. Um, they provide that next level, which is adequate even in infected patients, if worn appropriately, also with eye protection, as has been discussed. From there, then, you go into the fabric coverings. Um, and, um, you know, there's no good data right now. That's um, a bit of a unknown, you know, is a single layer enough? Do you need the double layer of the bandana? Um, do you need three or four layers? You know, there's no specific scientific data better than others. So I, you know, the bottom line is a mask. Is some are saying for alternatives is the bandana, but you've got to have at least the two layers. Um, I would say though that what's gotten very popular out there is the face coverings that have the one-way valve. Um, those are not ideal. Um, they uh, protect the wearer because it's a one-way when they breathe in, um, but it does not prevent those particles, those droplets from being exhaled by the individual wearing the valve. And so at CHKD, we've gone so far as to say that a face covering with a valve needs to have an additional uh, layer of covering over it uh, to help protect both directions in that. And again, to, to use the experience from the hospital, uh, patients are often coming in wearing their own face covering. Um, as everyone is well aware, there was a mask shortage at the beginning of this. So uh, many patients do have their own masks, so they'll often be wearing their cloth masks. We leave them in their cloth masks and we wear the procedural mask that Dr. Mitchell is speaking about. 
Um, and as far as um, changing out masks, um, in a surgical sterile environment, obviously the mask is gonna get changed with each separate surgery. However, um, in the emergency department, we're using the same mask for one shift, unless it gets soiled, wet, um, something happens to it. Um, but I come to work, I'm issued my mask for the shift, um, and that's what I wear um, and take uh, diligence to, uh, to not mess it up. Okay. And I, one addition, thank you for, for those comments. One addition is it all depends on how you wear the mask. You know, um, it's to be worn properly. It's got to be properly fitting, tight enough, not to be stifling, but it's got to cover the nose and the mouth. Um, you travel to various areas and the standard now is have it over the mouth and not over the nose. That's really not providing it any benefit. So the key is how the mask is worn. And I would have to say that um, even without the, the evidence and the data to support, um, you know, one type of mask over another cloth or layers or whatever, if you can hold the material up and you can see light filtering through it and it doesn't look like it's very tightly woven, it's probably not going to be as effective as something that is a thick material that's maybe doubled or tripled. So if you're going to bring your own mask, I think, you know, the more layers to me um, seems to make more sense as to be more protective. Um, Okay. Well, I, I appreciate that. I think um, two things I heard and learned there was those one-way valves, maybe not the best protection. And uh, the other is if you can see through it, probably need to add some additional layers. And so I will add that the school division does have plans to purchase masks for our staff so that they have, uh, uh, I think it's feral, you could weigh in, but I believe we've said uh, as many as three masks per staff member, which would be washable 50 times a piece. So that should certainly carry us through the through the bulk of the school year uh, and that those masks are being purchased to meet CDC guidelines. So we feel confident about those. Um, I'm gonna shift gears and start asking our staff some questions. And as I said to our physicians, you're welcome to stay on and, and uh, weigh in if you feel like um, you've got something to add because some of these are medical questions. I will note too, um, there is a big storm out here. So if, if uh, anybody's power goes down, we'll understand why you dropped off and we've got folks on deck to to pick up. Um, Mr. Mira, I'm going to turn to you and ask a, a HR question if it's okay. I'm actually probably going to ask you a couple. Um, the first one is um, why, why are teachers being asked, this is from a staff member, being asked to provide medical records and information. What's the purpose uh, for that? So could you, um, could you tackle that one, please? Sure. And, um, and I appreciate that question being asked because we have had a couple calls I believe what they're referring to is the uh, the information, this questionnaire or survey that went out to teachers primarily asking them if they want to work face to face uh, when we go back or um, if they want to go into uh, virtual school. And ultimately, when they click on virtual school, uh, if they have any, first of all, we're not asking for any medical uh, records. Uh, we're asking for information for anyone who might have uh, pre-existing medical concerns and that may uh, enable them to have an accommodation uh, to be considered for the, uh, the virtual school. What, what's different is we are using the same paperwork that we have always used uh, and, and having um, <laughs> Having several doctors on here, I'll be very careful how I say this, but they're very busy people. And normally what we do is the employee uh, would tell us their doctor and we would send them the forms, the doctor the form. But because we have a very quick turnaround trying to set up the virtual school, school administration needs to know who some of the folks may be that need a priority consideration to be placed in the virtual school. So instead of uh, asking the employee, who's your doctor and then mailing it or, or sending it to them, uh, we expedited it and we gave the forms to the, uh, to the employees to share with their doctor and send right back. It is not mandatory, uh, it's, it's voluntary, and it's actually to help you if you want to be uh, considered for an accommodation. Of course, uh, I'll add this too, the, the number of teachers that can go into the uh, virtual school um, for the first semester is going to be contingent on the number of students that, uh, that are 
requesting it. So did that pretty much answer that, or there, is there another part that I missed? Yeah, no, I think I think that's right. I think uh, there's the, the key part is that it's about prioritization. That uh, as we look at the number of teachers that we may need for the virtual learning center, uh, the prioritization, which is you know, the first tier of prioritization, are folks who have a demonstrable medical need to be teaching in a virtual environment, and that's why we're asking for that. Uh, form. We're not asking for medical records. We're asking for doctor to confirm based on the uh, form that's part of the ADA compliance, correct? And then the... Right. And, and everyone, go ahead, John. Everyone that requested, everyone that requested virtual, they don't have to send any, us anything. It, it's only correct. for those folks that want to be considered for the accommodation. Well, yeah, and, and so well, and it's a prioritization, right? And so if you if you ask for that, then we'll certainly consider you as a first priority for working in that environment. And then, second priority, those who are submitting information about family members they live with, to document that. And then third priority would be those who don't have those but still prefer to work in a virtual environment. And it just allows us to better place staff. And so we understand some folks had some concerns about that, but we hope that that helps with that. I think similarly, John, the other question about that was. Um, considered high risk due to a health condition. I'm not comfortable sharing my personal medical records. What are my options? Will not providing these prohibit me from being considered for virtual teaching? So, I mean, I think that we answered the question by saying you're not required to do this. It's voluntary. Um, right. Providing, yes. you're, and you're not sharing your medical records. You're asking your doctor to affirm that you have a qualifying health condition using an ADA compliant form. Right. Uh, and then ultimately right. the question about not being prohibited from being considered for virtual learning if they're not sharing that information. Absolutely not. You're, it lowers your priority. But our intention, I would say, and you've said this, I think, to other folks who've called you all, is to try to match as many requests for teaching preference as we're able to based on student requests. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And the other, the other part is those, any records um, that come from the doctor back and forth are kept in HR in a separate uh, confidential uh, location. It's not throughout the whole division. It's not the principal or your supervisor does not have access to that. HR keeps that very confidential. Thanks for that add-on. I know we've gotten some questions about whether or not that was part of your personnel file and it's not. So appreciate that. Okay, uh, Don Robertson, I'm going to just throw this one to you. H how will we handle seating for students who have a physician's note that exempt them from wearing a mask? Um, First of all, will it automatically exempt them from wearing a mask? And then will the parents of students seated near that student be given an option for alternative seating? So do you want to tackle, tackle that, Don? Yes, uh, yes, sir, absolutely. First thing we would do is uh, determine if there's another accommodation that the student could use other than a face covering. Maybe, as we talked about earlier, it's a face shield that the student might be able to wear um, based upon their, their uh, medical documentation. If not, neither of those would work, we would place those students in a classroom and ensure there's at least six feet of distance between them and other students in that classroom. And, and there was a question about alternative seating. So, you know, um, you know in other words, would, would a parent be able to say, well, I don't want my kids sitting next to that kid because they're not wearing a mask. And I think the answer to that is probably uh, we'll work with the teacher and the principal and the parent on a case-by-case -case basis and, and, and not anticipating that that's going to be widespread and, and just on a case-by-case -case basis try to sort through that, but certainly do so in a way that allows our parents to feel comfortable that their child is safe. Yes, absolutely. Dr. Spence, yes. Dr. Mitchell here. I would also add that to help the community navigate the possibility of concern about exemptions, uh, we are pulling together, matter of fact, tomorrow morning, so we hope to have something soon, a multi-specialty group of the pediatricians at CHKD from all the various specialties, pulmonary, allergy, asthma specialists, cardiology, developmental, mental health, and us as general pediatricians to help de develop a very, hopefully, understandable, um, easy to follow list of conditions that we consider uh, appropriate to potentially exempt a child from wearing a mask. That's probably not going to be a very long list. Um, there are very few cases where a child could not wear a mask. And so we're going to hopefully have a very standardized approach for the whole community to address those requests that we will also share with the, the school districts 
so that we can sort of be preemptive on the same page uh, from both directions. That's great. That will be um, very helpful. And I'm sure Mary will appreciate that as she's working with our folks to review those requests. Um, Farrell Hansiker, Chief Financial Officer, uh, this may be for you, it might be for John, but uh, the, a question came about, is contracting COVID-19 at work going to be considered uh, covered under workman's compensation? Um, Dr. Spence, that would be uh, a case-by-case -case basis. And for example, if somebody is diagnosed as having uh, the COVID-19, the question is, did they get that virus from a family member not at school, or was it conveyed by someone that they came in contact at school, which would be developed by uh, the uh, contact tracing process. So it just has to be handled by case by case basis. It's possible that it could be workers comp, but it's possible that it's not. Okay, Farrell, thank you. Um, and that would be similar, I think, to anything with relative to workman's compensation. We have specialists who work on that and review those claims and work with the, the folks who are making those claims to understand whether or not those qualify. So, so we'll continue with that process. Um, let me go down. Uh, Jack Freeman, our Chief Operations Officer, I'm going to turn to you. There are a number of questions that I think are, are sort of operational in nature. Um, as a this one is from a custodian saying, as a custodian, how would we be able to take control when there's students in the restroom and the, you know, there's, there's um, a high number of them inside or how would it be cleaned and maintaining social distancing? So you, maybe you want to talk a little bit about that, Jack. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, so, and I'll, I'll start with uh, our, our custodians as well as other members of our staff are going to receive training as we uh, approach the uh, bring the kids back to school. And when you receive that training, this is all good feedback with your supervisors. What, what are your expectations as you're performing your functions? Uh, but because this one is kind of bathroom related and how we're handling bathrooms, uh, I'm going to talk elementary school and then secondary schools. Um, so in our elementary schools, the principals have been asked to schedule bathroom breaks um, and send two to three kids in at a time so that we can kind of manage that flow. And uh, anybody who's experienced with uh, elementary schools, our, our teachers do a great job of creating structure for our kids um, and they will help create that structure. From a, a secondary standpoint, and this also applies for elementary school, uh, we wanna teach and model good, safe behavior. Um, distancing, avoiding congregating in the bathroom, um, certainly for everybody, wash your hands. We're gonna have signage that's gonna be posted in the bathrooms. Um, again, when you're uh, complete using the bathroom, washing your hands before you leave, uh, we continue to emphasize uh, those kind of safe practices. Um, Jack, I think too with the signage, we'll, we'll also have spacing signage to indicate where it's safe to stand when you're in there washing your hands or that sort of thing. Right, absolutely. Um, and then the day custodians will be uh, regularly cleaning bathrooms uh, every couple of hours going in, cleaning the touch surfaces in bathrooms and throughout the building uh, to ensure that the the bathrooms are remaining uh, sanitized. And Great. again, following up, you'll get more training uh, as the school year approaches to be able to uh, help you become comfortable with exactly what your expectations are. So Jack, just layering onto that, we have another question. It says the plan states that there'll be enhanced cleaning protocols. What are those protocols and who implements them? Do you wanna just briefly describe some examples of what that will look like? Uh, yes, so our, the plan that we have in place for en enhanced cleaning protocols, and when we say that, we're typically talking about custodians, and I'll leverage another piece that Dr. Robertson uh, had talked about previously, but it's about using the right PPE, uh, more frequent cleaning of high touch point areas, so things that get handled uh, a lot like doorknobs and other things, using safe CDC approved cleaners, uh, the training that I already mentioned, uh, and deep cleaning on nights and weekends. So. Um, for example, for our uh, cleaning on nights and weekends, we have gotten uh, updated hardware mis misters to be able to help clean uh, large areas or disinfect large areas in a very uh, short period of time in comparison by using a hand method. Uh, so those would be helpful to be able to make sure that we're 
uh, getting good deep cleaning done on nights and weekends as well. Right. Uh, the additional piece that I'll mention that Dr. Robertson mentioned before is, again, this is not just about, um, and how we stay safe isn't just about how custodial uh, keeps our uh, surfaces clean and disinfected. Um, we are also positioning disinfectant and uh, wipes in classrooms so that they could be used by other adults throughout the day uh, to keep our, uh, our surfaces disinfected. Sure. And, and I think that concurrent with the last question is, in addition to all the enhanced cleaning protocols, the hygiene protocols, and the really the kind of insistence on the cultural shift to things like washing your hands and using sanitizer and wearing those masks, um, kind of have to work together in conjunction. It's a cultural shift to, to, to not leave it to, we can just clean surfaces, but we also have to do what we have to do in terms of our interaction with each other. And so, so wanting to keep emphasizing that in our training as well. And Dr. Spence, if I can interject, because I know if I'm a secondary teacher, um, my question would be, what about, what's the student's responsibility? Know that I'm working with Dr. Rogers and we're going to create some learning experiences and absolutely share the training uh, procedures with students during the first couple of weeks of school while they're in the virtual environment. So they are crystal clear on the expectations of what it means to practice health mitigation strategies as a student. Where does your responsibility fall uh, prior to them returning? So they're gonna get a full dose of it in every class over the first couple of weeks or, or at least until we've covered all of the material, but we're gonna turn it into, rather than a we tell, we're gonna to try to turn it into a learning experience within those classes. Good. Um, I'm, I'm cognizant of our time. Uh, there are still some other questions that I really do wanna to try to get us to, but so Don, I'm gonna stick with you for a second. And could you, several questions about the health screening tool that was mentioned in the plan. Could you just elaborate on the health screening tool briefly? Yes, uh, we've developed a health screening tool uh, based upon CDC and Virginia Department of Health guidance. It's a tool that all individuals will use before they leave their house in the morning. And it asks them things like, you know, do you have a temperature of more than 100.4? Do you have any new cough or new sore throat or, or anything else that you can't um, apply to a known medical condition? And if any of those answers are yes, you are to stay home. Um, it is one, uh, it's, it's a document where we are relying on the families and the students and the staff to take this responsibility seriously, um, to do so every day before they come into school. And we feel like in doing so and wearing a face covering and adhering to our mitigation strategies greatly reduces the potential spread of the virus. So Mary, I'll ask you to, to jump in um, um, on, on that because I'm sure the follow-up question, well, what do you do if somebody sends their kid to school anyway and doesn't do the health screening? And I think that's where your nurses come into play and your work as a public health advocate working with parents. Um, and, and I'm going to go ahead and for time's sake, ask you another question that was asked from a nurse. If the, How are we handling students with COVID-19 symptoms then who do come to school? Um, do we have an isolation room? Are we going to put them all together in one place? Can you just talk a little bit about how that's going to work? If uh, an employee or a student comes into school and they, and they are ill and they need to be assessed, they will come down to the nurse. Um, the nurse will do uh, the assessment that they typically do, and they will include um, looking at the COVID-19 um, symptoms and have a protocol to follow. If one of the individuals um, falls into that criteria of having possible COVID-19 illness, then we do have a separate isolation uh, room area set up. Uh, that's It's either a completely separate room in the clinic that nobody else goes into except the nurse or it's outside of the clinic. Uh, the person that comes in will have to, we will put a mask on them, a surgical mask. Um, they will wear that and then they won't be in any contact with anybody else in, in the school itself. Uh, should we have a couple students in that category, uh, then we will maintain uh, six feet of social distancing uh, in that room between the two, and we will also make sure that they have the surgical mask on until they're picked up. 
We'll also make sure we're cleaning frequent touched areas. One student may go in there, we will clean it before the next student comes in, the areas that were touched. I appreciate that. So um, we have a lot of other questions and I'll, and I'll say now uh, to our staff who are on, and there's over a thousand of you, and I'm so thankful that you're, you're joining us tonight and I know that you have interest in, in all of these questions. We continue to update our FAQs, uh, both on the website directly attached to the plan, but also on our intranet site. Um, there, if you go to the intranet site, you'll see an employee COVID-19 resources link and you click on that and we've got employee FAQs that answer many of the questions that we're receiving. Um, but I do wanna tackle one last kind of set of questions because they're generally related to how are we handling um, um, moving back uh, into school and moving out of school. And, and so kind of uh, in general, the questions are if we're, if we're back in school, if we're yellow, yellow, or if we're yellow, green, we're back in school, can you elaborate on how we would go out to red? Um, and then the other one was a, a, about this kind of system based on the seven day average. And so then, you know, if, if the seven day average with, you know, like just turns to red, um, are we then waiting seven more days for red numbers before we, we take ourselves out of school? Um, Jack, you're responsible for the division's um, comprehensive safety plans, which include crisis response plans. I know this has been part of your conversation. Uh, would you like to uh, just speak a little bit to that, particularly the kind of how do we go out of school if, if something were to occur? And at first I'll note that with our health physicians on, on board here, our, our health care workers on board here, that, that we know we'll be working with them when these things start to pop up to say, okay, this is what it's telling us, what do we need to do now? And specifically with the public health department, because they are the ones who really do a lot of the advising on when to close schools. Um, but specifically in terms of our conversations, Jack, do you want to elaborate? Right, and if, so if I understand this question, this one is related to, we have gotten back into a face-to-face -face learning environment for some of, some of our students because we're in a yellow environment and then the trend goes the wrong way and starts going back towards the red. Is that the, the general gist of the question? That's, that's correct. So in those conditions, so we monitor that seven day rolling average. So it's not any specific spike in one day that would uh, cause us to take, uh, take action. And we monitor those daily as they come in. So if we saw that trend going in the wrong direction and we started to um, project that a, uh, there was a potential that if that trend continued, that we would have to go to a virtual in, in environment. We would communicate uh, early and often with what that potential is. We know how critical it is to be able to have stability and planning as we go through these types of transitions. Now, that being said, we've created these metrics with the importance of uh, the safety of our students and staff. Um, so when we get to a red standpoint, we want to quickly transition to non-face-to-face -face instruction, so virtual instruction. Now, creating that stability is we have a little bit of lead time uh, the way that the trend would go. Now, I think the way I've heard some of these questions is if we have a spike, it could not be seven days, it could be something shorter than that. And that's absolutely true. Um, but when we identify a trend moving in a direction, we intend to communicate that with our families, with our teachers to allow preparation time to be able to provide as smooth a transition as possible when the data indicates that we get to the red. Um, and when it does get to a red, it's important for the safety of our staff and our, uh, and our kids to transition to a virtual environment. I didn't know uh, if any of the physicians wanted to elaborate. I think that's a pretty clear answer, but if you had any other thoughts, I'll give you a moment to see me shed it. Okay, good. Um, you know, relatedly, and I'll, I'll, I'll kind of tackle this one, um, you know, folks want to know, well, how does this work? How does this 14 day thing work? And so what, what I, I'll, I'll try to explain briefly is uh, when we begin school, that kind of starts the clock for us. We're going to begin virtually and that starts the clock for us looking at the rolling seven day averages and those come in on a daily basis. Um, when we see that rolling seven day average hit the metrics that we're looking for, that triggers our 14 days. And that is a time for us to communicate to our parents and to our staff, hey, you need to begin preparing for the potential that we return to school in 14 days and that we're going to be monitoring this for the next 14 days with a specific seven day point that we're gonna be looking at. Is the trend seven days out stable and declining? Uh, and we'll communicate clearly at that point we think we're gonna go. 
Um, and then seven days after that, we'll continue to monitor. And if we hit that next seven day marker at the 14 day point, then we'll open school. Um, and, and so that, that gives you a sense of how that will work. Um, and, and we also want to be clear about that, that if at any time during that period, we, we go backwards and we go back to red, then we'll restart our clock. And that's intentional because we are looking for trending data. And so wanting to make sure that we have that good seven day rolling average. And so, um, um, so I want our staff to know kind of how that's going to work from our perspective and, um, and have that confidence that, that, you know, when we begin school, it won't be the next day that we would go uh, uh, switch from virtual to teaching face to face that we would face that in with communication um, along the way as we're monitoring the data. So I think with that, we have gotten to um, the end of our questions. We actually were able to get through quite a few of the questions that and, and thematically that we received. Um, there are a couple more out there about testing um, and we will capture those and we will work um, through uh, HR and our health and benefits folks to get information about that onto our FAQs relative to what testing might be available for our teachers and how that works. Um, and, and so we'll, we'll make sure that we get that up. Uh, outside of that, we are, um, um, as I said, I think at coming to the end and I'm, I want to just kind of reiterate and I've got a few, few quick announcements, but want to reiterate how much I appreciate all of our panelists uh, being here this evening, but even more so how much I appreciate the over 1000 folks who are joining us here on zoom and, and perhaps other folks who are following us elsewhere. Um, your interest matters, your concerns are my concerns. Um, I deeply uh, care for our staff and am concerned for your safety and I want you to hear that and know that uh, and, at the, and, and at the same time the same deep concern and care for the safety the well-being uh, of our students as I know all of you um, do and all of you have and, and for me um, what will what I'll candidly describe as the most difficult moment in my career is figuring out how to balance how to balance um, the needs of our staff and to keep you safe and to do everything we can to keep you safe uh, with what we know are the academic and the social and emotional learning needs of our students and some of the just horrific things that are emerging in the data and, and in the and in the research on what's happening to children who aren't in our schools and and uh, well documented um, challenges that our students are facing and the prospect of that happening for another year is just untenable to me as an educator, untenable to me as a superintendent. And so looking to seek the balance to say, when can we safely go back? And I know some people say, just, just do this for nine weeks. And my, my challenge there and my, my call to my colleagues is nine weeks is arbitrary. Um, nine weeks doesn't, and this is me talking this, I'm not speaking for anybody, I'm not speaking for our school board, I'm speaking for myself as superintendent. Nine weeks doesn't give you a sense of when it's safe to go back. It's just a number. Um, whereas like working together to identify when it's safe to go back and then getting ourselves back to school with our kids um, matters. So, so we're going to work together and we're going to do that. We're going to keep each other safe. Um, we know these are challenging times. I'll tell you that uh, one of the things that we have to do as we, as we work towards a culture shift, as we work towards this culture shift within our buildings of being safe, is to, to leverage everything at our disposal to do that, to make that culture shift happen. So one thing I want to I want to mention is that we've got a hashtag VB safe together uh, and we want to encourage you our staff to keep uh, to, to hit that hashtag VB safe together and, and show pictures of yourself and your family uh, being safe and enjoying your summer, uh, but doing so in ways that are responsible uh, and that help us build that culture shift that we can be together. We can um, enjoy the company uh, of one another, but do so safely. Um, and then and then prepare ourselves to be back together in our schools when it's safe to do so. One last thing before I go, uh, I just want to alert you before we go, I want to alert you to a very special parent connection opportunity for our parents. So if you uh, can help us spread the word, uh, parents and guardians of designated student groups uh, to learn about and ask questions regarding the fall 2020 plan and how these students will receive services during virtual learning. Um, this parent connection is going to be Monday night starting at 5 p.m. Um, with 30 minute targeted sessions for special education students, gifted and academy students and technical and career education students, particularly those students who are in the 
technical and career centers at the Advanced Technology Center and down on North Planning Road. So uh, those that information will be up on our website, specific times and registration details. Um, and as I mentioned at the outset, we will be doing a weekly VB Safe Together series on Thursday evenings. Next week's VB Safe Together series will focus on being safe in our global community. So if you'll please join us back here for that. We'll look forward to it. We thank you again for being with us here tonight. So stay safe, take care of yourself and your families and have a wonderful evening and enjoy uh, your extended weekend. Those of you who are on the summer hours with us.